Hey, welcome to the online tutoring review session for Keisha Brown's Math 1111 summer course. This will be the second review session that we're going to hold uh, in preparation for the second test. And today we've got a couple concepts to uh, go over. And I'm just going to uh, talk about the concepts that we're going to cover in this review session and then dive right into uh, working on her previous exams. So uh, for this review se uh, session, the sections that we'll be covering from the book are 2.3 through 2.8. And the actual concepts have to d uh, do with functions. What are they? Um, using the vertical line test to test if something is actually a function. Finding the intercepts, uh, x and y. Um, determining the domain and range, and uh, using the slope-intercept form of a line for various things. Uh, we're also going to cover linear equations, uh, finding the point-slope formula and using that. Uh, we're also going to cover how to determine if a linear equation or a set of linear equations um, are parallel or perp perpendicular to each other. And we'll also be covering transformations um, based on the fundamental functions. We'll talk about how to figure out if, uh, how to apply vertical or horizontal translations, uh, vertical or horizontal stretches and compressions, as well as reflections. And then we're also going to cover piecewise graphs, or piecewise functions, excuse me. And we'll do a little bit of graph analysis in determining if a, if a graph is symmetric, um, if it's an even or odd symmetry, uh, its behavior uh, over certain intervals, like if it's increasing, decreasing, or constant. Uh, we'll also talk about relative maxes, relative mins, as well as the difference quotient. So without further ado, let's begin. All right. So with this first problem, it's asking, is the following relation a function? This guy right here. Where is my? This guy right here. And in order to determine if something is a function or not, uh, what you can use is the vertical line test. And that's basically just drawing a line straight up and down draw that a little bit straighter, straight up and down, and sliding it from one end of the function to another, right? So from the left side of the x-axis to the right side of the y-axis. And the key is you want to make sure that as it slides across, it never uh, hits two points. It always only touches one point. So for example, here, it touches this point right there on the graph. And you test that for every other point on the graph to see if it crosses through multiple points. And even though um, this graph gets a little bit steep, uh, you're essentially not passing through two or more points. And therefore, this relation is in fact a function because it passes the vertical line test. Passes VLT. So in order to test a graph to see if it's a function, you have two options. You pass through one point, in which case it's a function, or you pass through multiple points, like so, in which case it's not a function, right? And that would look something like um, like this. If there was a graph that you drew, this is one kind of option that you could have. There's an infinite number of uh, graphs that you could try this with that wouldn't pass the vertical line test, and an infinite number that would actually pass the vertical line test. But this is will give you an idea of uh, what something will look like if it doesn't, right? So you see it passes through a point at the top right here, 
and through a point at the bottom down here. Okay, so let's move on to question two, which asks, um, given k of x, which is equal to the square root of x plus 1, find k of 3. And so that one's pretty straightforward. All you have to do is wherever you see an x or whatever variable is inside of the parentheses next to the function notation or in the function notation, you're going to replace that same variable in the actual function itself with whatever value you're plugging in, in this case, the 3. And so what that's going to look like is you plug in 3 for the x, add a 1, and then if you simplify that, remember to follow your order of operations, and anytime you have a function acting on something uh, that's inside of it, it's essentially like a parentheses. So you do the 3 plus 1 first, which gets you 4, and then you square root that, and so our answer is 2. Let me go ahead and box that, and that's our answer. Okay, moving right along to number 3. This question over here asks, uh, what is the domain of g of x? where g of x is equal to x plus 6 over x minus 2. Now, this one is pretty interesting. So the way I approach this is you kind of have to be familiar with your fundamental functions, like the uh, constant, linear, uh, quadratic, and polynomial, these, these all fall under a polynomial, um, and then exponents, exponential, logarithmic, um, root, or radical, and rational. And these guys, uh, what they look like would be, so this would be y equals, let's say, 3. Uh, normally, you'd see something like a capital letter uh, linear. You guys might be familiar with is y equals mx plus b. Uh, quadratic is a similar looking thing, but it's uh, raised to the power of 2. E um, exponential is some constant number raised to a variable power. Logarithmic is something along the lines of log base something, let's say 10 of x. Uh, radical is some root of uh, x. And the root can either be an even power or an odd power, and you determine the power by putting the number above the little squiggly on the uh, root sign. And rational is just y equals 1 over x. And so some of these guys, uh, namely the logarithmic, root and radical, and rational functions, all have uh, values for which you get undefined um, answers, right? So for example, with logarithmic, any value of x that's less than 0, uh, actually less than or equal to 0, is not in the domain. Right. Uh, for the root and radical, any value less than zero is going to be excluded from the domain. And for the rational, uh, when x is equal to zero, so when the denominator value here is equal to zero, then uh, that is also excluded from the domain. Everything else here um, covers all values for the domain. So you can go from negative infinity to positive infinity. So for like constant, linear, quadratic, exponential. And I didn't throw in the trig functions, but those are included as well. Um, the basic trig functions, the sine and cosine, those have a domain of um, all real values. The other trig functions get a little bit more complicated. So applying that knowledge, what we want to do here is say, okay, what kind of function does this look like? 
the one that we're currently working with, right? So the function that we're currently working with, um, it most similarly looks like 1 over x, right? Which we determined is uh, only excludes the value for which uh, the domain is equal to 0, right? So where this guy is equal to 0. And since we also know that since this is a linear equation, um, the domain is all real numbers, we don't have to exclude anything from there. So our main focus is the bottom guy, right? So we just have to figure out where x minus 2 is equal to 0. And uh, so we subtract 2 from both sides. Or sorry, not subtract. Wow. Add 2 to both sides. And so what we're left with is x is equal to 2. So that is the value f that we have to exclude from the domain. And the way we can do that is we can actually write interval notation where we'd say all values from negative infinity up to 2, but not including it, uh, are within the domain. And then also, after that, all values from 2, not including it, all the way to infinity, uh, are also included within the domain. So that would be our answer. Okay, so moving right along to number four here. This question asks, what is the domain of the following graph? And so you can see I've, I've already drawn um, a line here that kind of connects the uh, point, the, the closed circle point, and the open circle point, because they're right on top of each other. And so um, doing the same vertical line test thing that we did for the first problem, you can see, oops, kind of like move this uh, down. OK. So you can see um, if you slide this vertical line back and forth along the, the x-axis, what you'll find is that it'll hit some point on the given graph, right? So there are no breaks that we can see. Therefore, from what we can see, the domain is all real numbers, right? And so you can write um, you can write it like this, where you have the R with the double double um, I'm not sure what this thing is called, but the long thing on the left hand side. Um, the more possibly acceptable answer that uh, math teachers pretty much all agree on is interval notation where you write negative infinity to positive infinity, right? So if you just want to make sure that uh, there's no confusion in what you're writing, uh, this the R is completely acceptable, but the interval notation is there just to be sure. All right, so let's move on to the next uh, next set of problems here. So we've got um, question number five, graph x is equal to negative six. So this kind of has to do, uh, or doesn't just kind of, it, it does have to do with the uh, graph of a line. And you'll notice that it's kind of similar to y equals mx plus b, where m is equal to one. And actually, uh, let, me, let me correct this. It's more similar to the standard form of a line, which looks like uh, a, let me make this a little bit bigger, ax plus by equals c, right? Where a equals 1 and b equals 0, right? So 1 times x will just give you x, 0 times y will give you 0, and then c is negative 6, right? Equals negative 6. 
And so uh, what you do here is that for every single value of y, right, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, blah, 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 negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, et cetera, uh, x will always be 6, right? So the x point will always be 6 for each of those values that you plug into y. It's kind of uh, backwards from the way you're probably normally used to doing things, but this is a totally valid way of approaching this. And so what we end up with is a line, a vertical line, at x equals 6 right there, right here. And so that's, that's pretty straightforward. And uh, you'll get something similar if you had y equals uh, some value, right? So if we said it was equal to maybe 10, um, well, looks like it doesn't even reach that range for, okay. So but let's say it's uh, 6, right? And so uh, if we were to do that, let me change the color. Y equals 6. That would be right here. It would be a horizontal line instead of vertical. All right, so uh, problem number 6. Uh, determine the slope of a line between points negative 9 and 4 and negative 1 and 6. Uh, negative 6. So the slope, uh, which is also denoted as m, is equal to the rise of the over the run, or the change in y divided by the change in x. And so what that looks like is you subtract the first y value from the second one, uh, and then divide that by the um, uh, first x value subtracted from the second x value. So um, if this is, this guy right here is the first point, right? and this is the second point, the x and y's for the second point will be your x2 and y2, and the x, y values for the first point will be your x1, y1's. And so what that looks like is negative 6 uh, minus 4 divided by uh, negative 1 minus minus 9, and we just simplify that. Let me go ahead and say m equals. So negative 6 minus 4, uh, you just subtract 4 from uh, negative 6, and that gives you negative 10. And then this one, negative 1 minus minus 9, the minuses cancel each other, it becomes a positive. So you have negative 1 plus 9, which gives you 8, right? And so you're left with negative. 5 over 4 when you simplify because you can divide both side, uh, both the top and bottom by 2, right? So you cancel that. And that's your answer for uh, number 6. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at the next problem here. We have 7, which is given 5x equals 3y minus 6, find the slope and intercept. So the easiest way to do that, uh, in my opinion, is to just get it into slope-intercept form, which means that you, as I've written here, solve for y, right? So get y on one side. So if we rewrite the equation here, and go ahead and solve for y, we have this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to um, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and just explicitly shift these over. Because what you can do, if you want to get it in this uh, y equals mx plus b form, the way it's set up right now, the x is on the opposite side. You can just twist it around and automatically move it. But um, and what I mean by that is flip this side to the opposite side and vice versa. Though everything, not just one term. So instead of doing that, though, I'm just going to do it like this. So we're already uh, making good progress with this problem. Now you just got to divide by negative 3, negative 3, 
And so what you're left with is y equals 5 over 3x plus 2, right? And so the cool thing about the slope-intercept form is that the slope is your m value. That's multiplied by x. And your intercept is your b value, which is just hanging off on the side here. So you can write down that the slope is equal to 5 over 3. And the intercept, intercept, is equal to 2. And that is the answer. Okay, so moving on to number 8 here. Given h of x is equal to negative 3 uh, over 4x, is hx linear, constant, or neither? Okay, so um, let's break this down. So we have our three options that are given to us, linear, constant, and neither. And the way we test each of these is the um, power here of the variables are all 1, right? So that means that um, if you have an x in there, it has to be to the uh, 2, 1, to the power of 1, which is just x, and y has to be to the power of 1. In this case, y um, can take the place of the h of x here. So you could write y equals negative 3 over 4x, right? And so the y has a power of 1, but this x over here, since it's being uh, divided, right, uh, it's in the denominator, its power is negative 1. So x equals, uh, x to the negative 1 is equal to 1 over x. And then it's just being multiplied by a coefficient here. That means that it cannot be linear, right, because the powers are not all just 1. Constant is pretty straightforward to test. Uh, what you do is just make sure that at any uh, points on the, on the graph, they're all equal to the same value, right? So um, a fast way of testing this is just to plug in two points um, and see if they differ. Because as soon as you have two points that differ, you automatically know that it's not constant. Uh, if you get uh, the same value for both, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's constant, though. So you you'd either have to test more points or actually just graph it, right? So uh, fortunately, though, for this one, it's pretty straightforward. So I'm going to go ahead and plug in um, x equals, let's do 3, and x equals, um, can do 6. So um, what this would be is negative 3 over 4 times 3, which is negative 3 over 12, or negative 1 fourth. Okay, so we just want to make sure that this next one would be negative 1 fourth. Uh, if this was constant, so this would be negative 3 over 4 times 6, which is equal to negative 3 over 24. 24. And that is equal to negative 1 eighth. And so uh, negative 1 fourth is not equal to negative 1 eighth. Therefore, it's not constant. And that leaves only the last option, which is neither. Therefore, this function is neither. OK. So the next one we have here, write the equation of the line with a slope of negative 3 passing through the point 1, negative 6. So we already have m, right? This guy, this guy's m. So we can replace m with this. And then the next thing that you do is you plug your x value into x, and you plug your y value into y to solve for b. And so what that would look like is negative 6 equals negative 3 times 1 plus b. 
And so you have negative 6 equals negative 3 plus b. Go ahead and solve for b. Add 3 to both sides. And you are left with b equals negative 3. And I, I switched the sides, but um, the value is correct. And so the equation of the line, when we plug in our given m and our uh, found b, is y equals negative 3x minus 3. And that is the answer to number 9. Very straightforward. OK, so the next question that we have here is, what is the average rate of change for uh, h of x equals x to the third power um, over the interval negative 1 to 0? OK, and so in order to solve that, what you do is, so you have uh, delta h, x, uh, y, oops, not x, y, sorry, average, and this is a really gross looking delta, looks like a triangle, it's a Greek symbol, and so that's equal to uh, the value of the function at the second x minus the value of the function at the first x. And if the astute viewers uh, might notice that this looks very similar to the uh, rise over the run formula that we used on the first page of problems, then you subtract x1 from x2. All right, so what we're going to be solving for is h, the second x, uh, yeah, the second x value is 0. So h of 0 minus the first x, h of the uh, first x value, which is negative 1, uh, over 0 minus minus 1. Okay. And if we plug in 0 into x to the third, we get 0. And then if we plug in negative 1 into x to the third, we also get negative 1. So that stays the same over 0 minus minus 1. And if we simplify that, uh, the negatives cancel, so it just becomes plus 1. So 0 plus 1 is 1, and that's the same for the top and the bottom. So 1 divided by 1, anything divided by itself is just 1. And so that is the average rate of change for this function here. All right, so let's move on to the next set of problems. So we've got uh, six more here. So for this first one, um, it's asking, are the uh, following equations parallel, perpendicular, or neither? And in order to solve that, what you do is you actually just, um, if you get it into slope-intercept form, so if you could transform these into y equals mx plus b. Uh, I'm not really sure why it's not drawing. OK, yeah, I just had to switch the layer. OK, so if you get these into the y equals mx plus b form, right, uh, then you'll be able to tell because parallel lines have the same slope. Um, perpendicular lines have the, uh, what's the word, inverse reciprocal, I believe it's called. Um, neither is just any other slope. So for this first one, we solve for y, negative y, negative 5y, and then subtract 8x from both sides. So that's equal to negative 8x plus 3 divided by negative 5. y equals 8 over 5. x minus 3 over 5. 
And the way I got that is negative 8 divided by negative 5. Uh, the negatives cancel. doesn't simplify, so you get 8 over 5. And then 3 over negative 5 is negative 3 over 5. And then, um, so this next one, if you go ahead and, uh, what I'm actually going to do here is I'm going to just flip both sides because it'll be a little bit easier. So we have 5 over 4y plus 1 equals 2x. Now you go ahead and subtract 1 from both sides, right? And then I'm going to go ahead and multiply both sides by 4 over 5, by 4 over 5. And so what you're left with is y, right, because this cancels, and then these cancel out to 1, right, equals, and then 2, so this will really become negative 1 over here, right? So 2 times 4 over 5 is 8 over 5x, and then negative 1 times 4 over 5 is negative 4 over 5. So the key here is that the m values, the slopes, for both of these functions are the same. Also, um, since these functions are not the same function, right, even though the slope is the same, they uh, go through different points, so not the same. My messy handwriting right there. Um, that means that these uh, two functions are, in fact, parallel. So same slope, different functions. All right, so number 12 here says, if the base salary is 400 a week, right, plus 12% of uh, commission on whatever sales are made, what function could represent weekly salary? So this one is pretty straightforward, right? Fortunately, um, it gives us the intercept. So no matter what we do, we're guaranteed 400, right? So we can just throw in a plus 400 here. And then 12% commission on sales. Well, first, uh, when you, you, you have to convert that percent into uh, like a standard number thing for the function. So to convert that, you just add, oops, not zero, zero. You just add uh, two decimal places, right? Or move it over two decimal places. So you're left with 0 0.12, right? And so that's 0 0.12 times x plus 400. And that is our answer. Pretty straightforward. <coughs> All right. So up next we have number 15. This one is a bit of a doozy. So um, there are three kinds of symmetries, right? If we draw graph here. So this is, or not a graph, but um, a, the Cartesian coordinate plane. So you can have symmetry over the y-axis, right? You can have symmetry over the x-axis, and you can have rotational symmetry about the origin. Right, and so that means that if you rotate the graph some amount, if it uh, looks the same, then it has rotational symmetry. And so there are a couple methods of solving this. If you, to check over the x-axis, so over x-axis, the way you do that is you um, make y negative and check to see if it's the same. So the original function, x equals y squared plus 3, should equal um, uh, 
negative y squared plus 3 if, uh, if it has symmetry about the x-axis. And so when we solve this, we end up with x equals the negative gets canceled because that's negative y times negative y. And so you're left with y squared plus 3. Therefore, these are in fact equal, and there is symmetry over the x-axis. Now, over the y-axis, and I apologize for my handwriting. I know it's so, it's pretty terrible. Uh, you do the same thing, except you set x negative, right? So we have x equals y squared plus 3 is the original function, and test it against negative x uh, equals y squared plus 3. Well, right off the bat, you can see that uh, that will, in fact, not work because you have a negative on this side and not on this side. So that is not the same. Therefore, there's no y-axis symmetry. Now, for the origin, you set both negative. So both x and y negative. And so we've kind of already seen um, up above what we can expect to happen. Um, so we have our initial function here. And if we plug in negative x equals negative y squared plus 3, well, what we end up with is uh, negative x equals y squared plus 3, which is not the same. So it only has uh, x-axis symmetry. Okay, three more problems here. Um, so on which intervals is the graph that is shown in the problem increasing and decreasing? So the graph, uh, which I forgot to draw here, looks something like this. And it's, let's see, one, two, three, four. Ooh, I need more space. Okay, let me do it this way. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then one, two, three, four, five, also six. Wait, no, is that seven? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, one, two, three, four, five. And it looks like uh, this. Okay, so this is pretty straightforward. Um, the intervals that this graph will be increasing is where the next point over is larger than the previous point, right? So it's clear, it, basically where it's angled up. So it's clear that uh, these intervals that I've just boxed off are increasing, so increasing. And the decreasing is just the opposite, right? So this interval here is decreasing. Decreasing. So it's increasing from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, negative 5. And that's inclusive, so I'm using the square brackets all the way to 0. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, hmm, I'm going to go ahead and include that, actually. Yeah. So, and then, so that's this, this side here. And then on this side, we have from positive 2 to uh, positive 5 is where it's increasing. And then decreasing is just between those two intervals. And so that's from 0 inclusive to 2 also inclusive. And that's how you solve that. <coughs> All right. So um, the next one is uh, question number 18. Find P plus G of X and find the domain. Okay. So in order to find... 
plus g of x, what you do is you literally just add p of x plus g of x, which I've written here and here. And so that is equal to x squared plus 3x plus the square root of x plus 1. So uh, the domain for both of these guys Uh, for p of x is all real numbers, right? For g of x, it's uh, all numbers where x is greater than or equal to 1, right? Because uh, it's an even root, right? This is the square root of x plus 1. Um, that means that you can't plug in negative numbers. And so not 1 here, negative 1. So if you plug in anything less than negative 1, you're going to get a negative number. So uh, if we're sticking with the integer values, if you plug in negative 2, that'll be negative 2 plus 1, which gives you negative 1. Square root of that is uh, an imaginary number. It's not real, right? So uh, you have to stay within those limits. So negative 1 is the lowest you can plug in for that. And fortunately, uh, there's no complicated uh, function composition going on here. So you basically uh, constrain the domain of this function with what, uh, the tightest constraints for both of these, right? So since this accepts all values, and this one um, requires that x is greater than or equal to negative 1, the domain of this function of so domain of p plus g of x is equal to uh, negative one inclusive to infinity and that's the answer okay so this last problem here uh, find the difference quotient of f of x equals negative three x plus eight the difference quotient is just the function plus some um, some interval here, this h, right? So you're adding that to x uh, minus the original function, and then you divide by that uh, interval that you added, right? And so we plug in x plus h into wherever you see an x, in the original function, x plus h, whoa, x plus h, there we go, and then subtract the initial function, so that's, oh, hang on, I missed one thing, plus 8, and then subtract the initial function, negative 3x plus 8, and then you just divide by h, right, and so the key here is that we are not defining h right now h can be anything. So let's go ahead and simplify that. So this is equal to that. This is equal to, I'm going to go ahead and distribute the, the 3 to both of these guys, and then the negative to both of these guys as well. So you're left with 3x minus 3h plus 8 minus, oh, sorry, plus 3x, because the minus cancels, minus 8. And then that's all divided by h. And so you'll notice that we have a negative 3 times x over here and a positive 3 times x here, which cancels out to 0. And then we also have a positive 8 here and a negative 8 here, which both ca uh, cancels out to 0. And then we um, we go ahead and simplify that. So we have equals negative 3h on top divided by h on the bottom. The h's cancel to 1. So we have negative 3 times 1 equals negative 3. And that is our difference quotient. And that is also our final problem. So thank you for sticking around for the uh, review session. Um, be sure to catch the next one, which will be
on uh, July the 7th in preparation for her third uh, math exam for Math 1111. Hope to see you there, and uh, have a great day.